everybody. Today we are <laughs> going to do it in English, <laughs> and I hope you will enjoy it. I'm Emily Lau. This is Inside and Outside Lechco, and I'm very happy to uh, introduce to you my guest today is uh, Crystal Charlie Yeung, who is a consultant for Migrasia, and that's an organization which deals with the uh, many things relating to foreign domestic workers, and of course. Uh, foreign domestic worker is nothing new to us. In fact, I have said many times, Charlie, that if we don't have them, Hong Kong will grind to a halt, okay. <laughs> almost literally. So we need them, and we are very grateful to them. But today, we want to discuss the problems that many of these people and also their employers are facing during this uh, coronavirus pandemic, and because every day. When the uh, administration give their afternoon press conference, they may say, "Oh, today we've got another domestic worker infected, or whatever." So there are actually many problems facing uh, foreign domestic workers, and I speak with a little bit of authority because I've been following it for many years. I even travel to Manila and Jakarta in two o one five to talk to their ministers yeah. in both countries. To ask them to do more for their own citizens, and of course, we in Hong Kong, the government should do more too. So anyway, so Charlie, what would you say is the biggest problem facing our foreign domestic workers in Hong Kong now? Um, Emily, well, like you said, foreign domestic helpers and their issues. You want to call them helpers? Uh, they want me to call them workers. All right. So whatever you like. Workers, uh, foreign domestic workers, um, is and their issues are not new to Hong Kong. We've heard about um, exploitation, um, all the way to trafficking issues facing them. For many years now, but what has happened with COVID and the pandemic is that it has highlighted the most pressing issues faced by domestic workers. So, for example, the issues concerning their working conditions, their um, living conditions, um, the way they are exploited by money lenders and employment agencies are really coming to light because of COVID. Yes. So, uh, because now I think uh, many, a lot of attention is focused on the fact that some of them get infected uh, when they are in between jobs mm -hmm. uh, in their boarding houses. Uh, do you think that is a very serious problem? Um, you asked what the most serious problem is, and the boarding house issue is definitely of concern, um, and it's come to light recently. Um, but compared to, say, places like Singapore, maybe we want to make reference to that, the issue with the uh, outbreaks in certain dormitories facing migrant workers is obviously drastically different from Hong Kong. We have isolated cases in Hong Kong. Um, the government has tried to trace the workers who have been infected, and it seems to be isolated cases. But what it does point out is a lot of problems facing the workers because one of the workers, if I understand correctly, um, who has been infected, has hopped three boarding houses within just over a week. That shows you that their living conditions is very difficult and not sustainable. Nobody would voluntarily choose to do that. Well, has Migrasia or other organizations raise this with the Hong Kong administration, with the Secretary for Labor, uh, about you know improving the condition. You talk about those boarding houses. Mm -hmm. I understand that there are more than one thousand employment agencies, maybe twelve hundred, huh? but only four hundred are actually licensed by their government. Mainly, of course, is. Uh, The Philippine government and the Indonesian government. So there are 800 or more who are not licensed, and in Chinese they call them tengja, is a sampan. So they just sort of uh, latch on to the other ones to get to get uh, work, to get business. So I mean, what the hell is going on? If there are over 800 unlicensed agencies were operating, surely that cannot be good for the. Uh, Welfare of the domestic workers and for the employers. Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, can you tell us a bit more, as far as you know, how how terrible this situation is? Um, the issue with unlicensed employment agencies actually is one of the primary focuses of Migrasia. Um, as you said, 
it is rampant and quite egregious how so many employment agencies in Hong Kong can go unregulated, <laughs> unlicensed, and for such a long like period of time as well. Um, we have pointed this out um, to several government departments. Actually, Migration works closely with um, officers in the Labor Department, Immigration, Social Welfare, um, and it is a constant struggle. Um, often we hear back from them, it's a resource issue, it's an enforcement issue. Actually, it's a lot of issues. <laughs> so they're not doing anything. That's uh, the <laughs> Well, as part of the anti-epidemic fund relief package, I think it was issued sometime in June, um, I think it was the Labor Department gave $50,000 to every employment agency that is licensed in Hong Kong. So the 400, huh? The 800 <laughs> did not get it. Um, well, no, but even then there were quite a few problems. A lot of domestic helpers are unhappy with that because there was no public consultation. Um, a lot of agencies are actually owned by the same person um, there's not a lot of check on whether the agencies even placed any domestic helper in the you know past year or how many they placed. So really, the resources funneled into this did not trickle down to the people who need it the most. So, so, but now I think people are concerned with the pandemic, mm -hmm. and as you said, one uh, domestic worker was went to three boarding houses in a period of a few days and nobody could track them and now they say they're asking the police to try to find them. Mm. So, I mean, the situation may not be as serious as in Singapore, but it could get out of hand, isn't it? How can we get these people to cooperate? And is it true that the Hong Kong government does not really bother? They don't know, they don't care about the 800-odd agencies which are unlicensed, which have been operating for many years. I mean, really, this is quite outrageous. It is outrageous, and we want to try to highlight incentives for the government to care because it is important to Hong Kong society as a whole, even if you put the rights of domestic helpers aside for a second, which we shouldn't, but it is in Hong Kong's interest to combat this criminality, um, and it plays a lot into the human trafficking scene, which again is a big topic um, within Hong Kong recently. Um, Emily, you mentioned Singapore again. Um, the difference there is though, a lot of the, um, the outbreaks in the dormitories in Singapore are migrant workers who are not domestic helpers. Just like in Hong Kong, domestic helpers in Singapore have to live in with their employers. So the outbreaks there are more for uh, construction workers and that's how, that's why it's such a big proportion of the, um, the infected people come from. So, I mean, so where do we start? You think we should start with licensing the agencies and uh, how can we keep track of all these domestic uh, workers? And in fact, they say that the estimate is there are about 5,000 who are floating around looking for work because the Secretary for Labor, uh, Lord Chi Kuang, asked uh, them not to go back. They say, you stay here, you change job here. We make it easier for you to change job because if you go back and we get new people to come, it is even more difficult to fight the pandemic. So what, 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 what is migration proposing? Mm. Um, there's a lot of elements to that question, but I'll narrow it down yeah. to one of the crux of the issues, which is, sure, that sounds like a good idea to have the workers already in Hong Kong who either have their contracts expired or have been terminated to then remain in Hong Kong and look for employment rather than have an influx of new workers come to Hong Kong. But what are the practical realities of this, and has the government uh, provided resources and, or put their minds to it, right? Because number one, uh, domestic helpers who are out of work will have to pay for their boarding houses. Um, they will have to pay for their food and accommodation and very rarely that they have the resources to do this. Um, those who cannot stay at shelters, the shelters in Hong Kong have been overwhelmed. All the frontline organizations that work with the domestic helper space have been uh, talking about this and trying to find solutions for it. Um, a lot of the times a helper can finally finds a space to stay at a shelter overnight. The next day they have to wander around with their luggage because they can't stay in the daytime. And so there's so much traffic back and forth and that's really compounding the problem. So, I mean, really, even if you have to give them free testing, it doesn't help. <laughs> you may say, oh, your test was negative. I mean, next day you may catch it if you go to another boarding house, which is so overcrowded, maybe not so hygienic and so right. on. So, so you want the government to what, to get some hotels to put them there? Who's going to pay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are your proposals? 
Well, the question always is, where is this money coming from? Who is going to pay? A lot of employers um, find it difficult or would not want a new helper to uh, be quarantined in their homes. Yeah, um, of course, it could be dangerous. Right. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Chan has suggested that... Who is Thomas Chan? He is the head of the Employment Agency Union in Hong Kong. I see. Many issues with that. Well, and his employment know. agencies, I guess, are licensed ones. Huh? Uh, there are s many, many questions surrounding that, and there have been a lot of violations of his agencies, um, of the Code of Practice for Employment Agencies and other uh, policies and laws. Um, we don't necessarily have to get into that now, but a very poor comment, in my opinion, was made that they should just stay at, I think, um, I could be misquoting, and I don't want, I want to be careful, but at some sort of resort somewhere in Hong Kong. Resorts, uh, Disneyland. I, right, until, until they can... Um, because the employers should not be bearing the brunt of housing them during the quarantine period. And fair enough, because a lot of employers have been hit financially themselves, sure. right? But where do we put this onus of um, housing and accommodating domestic helpers during the situation? I think it's a shared responsibility. Yes, I mean, something, some solution must be found. So maybe each party can chip in a bit. Right. Uh, the government, I think, is reluctant to pay and the employers cannot and don't want to pay. And the workers, of course, they have no money to pay. Right. But if we get suddenly an explosion of the uh, pandemic, mm -hmm. <laughs> then the whole world pays. Exactly. And it could be very, very expensive. And our whole hospitals, they say, are bursting at the seams. That's why they need the mainlanders to come and help us. So uh, this is, some people say, it's like a, a ticking uh, time bomb. Mm -hmm. And I guess the, the workers, you know, they, are very, they, they just don't know what to do, isn't it? Right. And they don't have the money. But these boarding houses are not free. Exactly. They have to pay, isn't it? Is it they say, somebody says it's about $70 a, a night or something. It varies. The boarding houses are not free. And like you said, they're very crammed, overcrowded. And there is absolutely no regulation on any sort of minimum standards of sanitation for these places. Um, the offer of free testing and free masks to um, workers who stay at these boarding houses were only introduced recently, I understand, because of what has happened. Um, so the sort of catch up by the government, minimal as is, has been comparatively slow. If we consider when the pandemic first hit Hong Kong. Yeah. And, and, and they, they don't even know where these boarding houses are, isn't it? Yeah. Because some of them are run by unlicensed That's agents. Yeah. So, so even if they say, oh, I give you free testing, <laughs> where do you find the domestic workers to give the free testing to? Can Migratia help? Uh, Migratia has developed, my colleague has developed a program that has, it's, it's basically a uh, virtual map that tracks all the agencies that we have managed to locate and find. How on many TV. have you got? Um, we try to find as many of the unlicensed as well as the licensed <laughs> agencies as possible. Um, obviously, it takes a lot of effort to continue updating these charts, um, but we believe that at least identifying where these agencies are, where they operate, is the first step. And, uh, and have you told the government? Have you given your information to the government? Um, we repeatedly communicate with the government. Oh, you do communicate? All, all the time, they, they, yes. they are happy to talk to you? Um, some of the times they are receptive, some of the times we get the cold shoulder, um, but I think it's a process and communication. We just can't stop, right, even if we're not getting a positive result. Yeah, I have, had, I have held meetings with the uh, Immigration Department and Labor Department officials when I was a legislator. And when we did have meetings, uh, they were quite good, they were quite responsive. Yeah. But of course, it's not easy to set up such a meeting. <laughs> And uh, so I think the most important thing is for the authorities to really get to grips with the problem. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, if you can't even find them, how can you help them? And even if you do test them, and, you know, and then if they go back to such overcrowded and unhygienic uh, host, uh, boarding houses, they may get infected the following day. Right. And also another problem is that they have to wait quite long for their visa to mm -hmm. be renewed. What, what is your understanding of the problem there? So what um, traditionally what happens is if a domestic worker is uh, her, 
the contract is expired after two years, it will take two, uh, around two weeks for the visa to be renewed. Um, if they are terminated or other circumstances um, that break the contract, then it usually takes a longer period of time. Because of COVID, because of travel restrictions, um, um, there has been, I guess, immigration has been overwhelmed. Um, and the time that they have to wait in between contracts or even just leaving Hong Kong or coming back into Hong Kong has been, it's just blown up. And the policies on what to do in these situations are very unclear, not just to the helpers themselves who have language barriers, who find it very difficult to understand what's happening, but also to the front lines, civil society organizations, lawyers, who help them. Yeah, I, I have talked to the government a long time about the language barrier. Because if you have so many Indonesians or Filipino, Filipino may be easier, they can mm -hmm. speak English, but the others, they cannot. So it, it should not be that difficult to get some interpreters to, to, to help them. Otherwise, if you can't communicate with them, yeah. how, how, can you, how can you try to understand their problem and to solve it? Right. Um, and so you've highlighted actually one of the main problems that are facing helpers at this time. We look at it from two umbrella issues. One is how COVID has affected their welfare and livelihoods. But also the second uh, branch of that is how COVID has reduced their ability to access help and assistance. Yeah. Um, and because a lot of government institutions that are supposed to help these people um, are closed due to the pandemic, they have hotlines, but the hotlines are not in languages that the helpers can understand. Mm. Well, that is really terrible. So uh, I, I think, and I'm sure many employers, maybe some of them are watching, they feel also very, very troubled and very bothered, isn't it? Because they need help. And it seems that help is not coming and then maybe their work is infected. So what do you suggest employers can do? Um, just from personal experience now, I have a... You, you're an employer. I am not an employer. <laughs> I'm not an employer. Um, I have friends who are, and they have helpers who are nearing the end of their contract. Um, but the, it's unclear whether the helper will be able to um, obtain a t plane ticket to fly home. And if not, then what happens in the meantime? I mean, these policies are not clear to the employers who um, frequently actually care quite a bit of, for their helpers and want to do as much as possible, um, but nobody really seems to know the solution. That's bad. So I, I think the, the administration, I hope somebody is listening, uh, you must do something to help the workers, to help the employers, and of course to crack down on the unlicensed agents. Absolutely. That thing has been going on for so many years. Much too long. It is really, it's, it's quite, quite ridiculous. I just cannot understand why the administration doesn't do it. And the consulates, you're in touch with the consulates too. Do you think they are doing enough? Uh, the consulates are receptive to our approaches. Um, and when we raise issues, there is communication, but they certainly can do a lot more because, as you mentioned in the beginning, these are their people. When yeah. you went to, uh, to Manila or to Jakarta, Jakarta, speaking with their governments, you are asking them to protect their people that they have sent uh, to Hong Kong. To, to make country. money for exactly. the country. <laughs> to bring back to their home countries, right? To feed back into the economy. So it is in their interest, and in fact, their obligation, I would say, to improve the welfare of their people here. Yeah, and, and of course, one thing I talked to them about in, in 2015 is about the charges. Some of these, uh, what we call loan sharks, and they charge the migrant workers a lot of money before, even before they take off, before they leave their country. They are hugely in debt already. And these people say, now, if you want to go overseas to work to earn money, you have to pay. And then you pay and then, uh, and then they say, how do I pay you back? Oh, don't worry. Every month you have a salary and you give me a cut. You maybe give me 50%, 80% of your salary. And maybe you do it for one year or two years. I mean, is this still going on? This is absolutely still going on. But um, as you mentioned, it's now more noticeable. So when it is noticeable, at least some sort of enforcement can be, some sort of oversight can be put on top of it. But so much of it goes escaped, or even when the authorities are alerted to this issue, nothing is done. 
very curious about that, and a lot of organizations are trying to say, hey, this is basically, we're putting all the evidence in your face. How This is a crime. How are you not addressing this police, labor department, and so on? Um, but it's an uphill battle. Yes, you've given it to the police, yep. to the labor department, mm -hmm. and they still would not do anything about these loan sharks or whatever you Very call them. Very difficult. But I do want to commend um, something that happened recently. Is that yeah, the police? That? At least some good news. This is some good news, <laughs> yes. The police cracked down on a loan shark syndicate. Um, and actually, my Gracia has been working with police for a couple of months now um, to give them evidence and what we have been gathering from our clients. Um, the police actually went to that money lender um, and arrested people from that money, uh, from that agency. Um, they, I think the evidence was that they had loaned around 23 million Hong Kong dollars to Filipino domestic workers wow. at an interest rate with the highest interest rate of, I think it was over 195%. <laughs> and to give you a benchmark, the maximum legal interest rate in Hong Kong is 60%. Yeah. So this is just one, a drop in the bucket though, but at least. And, uh, and they are taking action. Huh? At yeah. least some action has been taken, so we're yes. happy. So I think and the other thing is you have to educate the workers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know there is a, an NGO which teach them financial management. Yes. Because some of them may not know, you know, they just come here and they need money, they went and borrow and got themselves into deep trouble and don't know how to get out. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they take away their passport or okay. things like that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. To making it to make it very difficult for mm -hmm. these women, mainly women too. Yep. Very sad. Right. So are you providing some sort of education or whatever support to these workers? Um, as you say, a lot of frontline NGOs, such as I think the one you're mentioning is probably Enrich, um, Empower You, um, Help, a lot of organizations, um, Hong Kong Dignity Institute, uh, try to educate the clients they meet um, on what Hong Kong laws are, on what their rights are, and sort of on the do's and don'ts and what to be cautious and aware of um, when taking out loans. Um, and we have seen actually um, this to be effective, but it really needs to proliferate amongst the community a lot more. So if, if there are domestic workers watching this now, and if they are in trouble or they need help, uh, who do you suggest? Should they come to Migratia or who do you think they should contact? Uh, depending on what their issues are, there are a number of organizations you can contact Migratia. Um, is definitely one of them and we have a big Facebook presence so even if you find that you cannot come out of your homes you you have your cell phone you can find us um, on Facebook um, and we usually try to respond as quickly as possible and arrange a time or at least some advice to give to you uh, other organizations as I mentioned earlier there is a uh, help for uh, domestic helpers or domestic workers um, there is um, enrich who um, gives um, training to people um, on their um, sort of money, uh, financial rights, uh, and a lot of law firms also do pro bono uh, work and will try to help and um, initiate the process for, for recourse. What about the consulates? If they go to the consulates, do you understand whether they can get some support and some help there? It really depends. Um, the consulate operating hours have changed because of COVID. Um, and also, it depends what the issue is, whether the worker herself can adequately uh, communicate the full range of issues that actually she has been a victim of. Because oftentimes, people don't even know what their rights are. So they say, oh, this one thing has happened to me. But when you start interviewing them, you realize a whole range of things have happened to them for a very, very long time. And so it takes time um, to get this information. And I think sometimes the consulates are overwhelmed, but um, we do try to work together and there is, um, it is a point where uh, if you need help that they should try to access. And now of course with COVID and there's are told to keep social distancing, right. but they come out with <laughs> big numbers on weekends. So what do you suggest they should do? And we can understand they want to come out and breathe some fresh air. Mm -hmm. And the police or the labor department say, oh, no, no, don't gather like that. Right. What do you suggest they should do? I'm not sure what my suggestion is, 
the starting point is fair, social distancing, right? The rules should apply to everyone because I think we should look at the domestic workers and Hong Kong residents and everyone as one community rather than separating saying, oh, which rules are applied to whom. But I think we often come from a position of stigma and discrimination. We go, oh, look at these crowds of domestic workers, when we should come from a point of understanding because you and I, Emily, if we cannot gather at a park, there are other places we can go. But they do not have those alternatives, right? Even when it's not in times of COVID, I don't think their preferred gathering points would be on footbridges, right? Yeah. So this is a problem that is exacerbated by COVID, but really also exists in ordinary times. And I think a lot of resource or thought should be turned onto this. Yes, I, I have talked to the administration a long time ago to find somewhere decent mm -hmm. for them to gather mm -hmm. on the weekend, not just, as you say, on the bridges, on the pedestrian right. crossing and so on. So, well, we have how many of them here? 400,000? Approximately over there. So, it's a huge number of people and they are making big contribution to Hong Kong. Just imagine if we suddenly have no foreign domestic workers. <laughs> I think many people will scream, will go crazy. So, they are helping us a lot. So, it's time that we do our part to make their life easier. And uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done for the government, the consulates, and the NGOs, and all of us. So, well, thank you very much. I think uh, maybe we invite you back, <laughs> because there's so many problems that we can talk about again. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.